Hello everyone. Today we will be looking at uh, pre-processing and so basically pre-processing is whatever you do to the data before you pass it to your machine learning model for training. So in that sense, uh, whatever slicing, dicing, adjusting you need to do to the data, uh, that's all pre-processing. So um, yeah, let's get started directly, I guess. So uh, first let's just import a data set. And let's just take a look at it. So dot head. Okay, first. Uh, numpy pandas scikit-learn dot preprocessing import label encoder. Okay, those are the libraries we'll be using. Now pd dot read csv is used to read a csv file. Okay, so yeah. Now dot head shows you the first five odd rows of this data set. So if I just run it, this is what it shows and dot describe is also useful. Uh, it shows you various statistical uh, features of various columns. Uh, notice that it only computes these features for the uh, numeric columns. So count, mean, standard deviation, minimum, the quartiles, maximum, yeah. All the categorical columns have been kind of left out or rather all the non-numeric columns. So now, one, the very first thing you should do pretty much is dealing with missing values. Look at alley over here. There are so many columns which do not have any value for alley. So there are four things we can do with missing values. Firstly, if it's like uh, there are just a few rows with missing values in that particular column. You can just drop those rows. This uh, assumes that you have plenty of data available, of course. So uh, don't do this if there is a shortage of data. All right. And uh, another thing you can do is if there are if in one particular column, there are too many rows which have null values then you can just drop that column because it's unlikely that you will be able to glean much information from that column anyway. And uh, if there is some default value which has some meaning, depending on the feature, depending on the domain, if some default value is there, you can replace the missing value with the default value. Or you can uh, use the mean, the median or the mode this mean median mode thing is typically done when there is a shortage of data or if the column is important for training. And then another thing you can do is you can use clustering or some other methods uh, like SMORT. Uh, no, not SMORT. That's not for this. Uh, you can use some other methods uh, to uh, infer the data. So here, uh, a lot of these are judgments which you have to make. There are no uh, fixed rules that you have to outdo it exactly in this way. So to get the number of rows with null values, just do this. Is, is na dot sum. So dot is na returns a boolean matrix, which a boolean uh, data frame which is pretty much like this every row every column it just shows you whether that particular value is null and now if you just take the sum of all of those then you obtain this table so id subclass zoning no null values lot frontage has some null values alley has a lot of null values fireplace uh, this thing also has a lot of null values Electrical has one null value. So uh, let's get rid of that row. So here, main df 
electrical dot is an a returns a boolean series right so that boolean series give when you basically when you whenever you pass a boolean series or a boolean vector to main df dot lock so dot lock is basically a command to return these particular locations based on the indices so here you are passing a boolean boolean series so for whichever values it is true it will return those rows okay and this is for getting all the columns right so just have a look at this it just returned the index 1379 So now we'll just drop that. Okay. Now notice this thing. In place is equal to true. This comes up with a lot of uh, operations on data frames. So what happens is most of these operations, when you perform them, they will return a new data frame, and you have to store that in a separate variable or sometimes in the same variable depending on what you want. But the thing is. that is very memory inefficient and uh, because basically you are creating a copy of the whole data frame even though you just have one operation to do over there so instead what you do is you do in place is equal to true and rather than creating a copy uh, you just use the same main data frame and perform the operations in place on that this is important okay because uh, suppose you have a data frame that has uh, i don't know hundreds of thousands of rows and it's like suppose your computer has only 8 gb ram and your data frame takes 7 gb now if you perform an operation which is not in place suddenly you have 7 gb plus another 7 gb because you made a copy and that won't fit and then you'll have some kind of crash and an error instead if you do it in place you will only have one copy and that will uh you'll just basically be using only 7 gb at once yeah so now we've done that now is any dot sum notice that there is no null value in the electrical column now so now let's see ali so there are 1300 odd Null values and there are fifty plus. So basically, there are ninety values and most of the rest are null values. Okay. So now what we can do is uh, we have two choices. Either there's a default value, which we could put, or we just drop the column. So just for the sake of it, I will drop the column. So df dot drop x is equal to columns, labels is equal to alley. in place is equal to true and now see ali is not there now dot unique returns all the unique values in a series okay so you see whether are nn and these various uh, identifiers right now here is where you know you have to make a choice maybe there are many houses which don't have a fireplace hence the nn over there so we could probably put a feature no fireplace this completely depends on your data and depends on your domain okay so let's just do this so fill na is a useful thing so basically what you do is you take the series you fill it with na uh, with a particular fill the na's with a particular value again in place is equal to true and now have a look at the value counts the value counts now no fireplace has been added now what else is there so we have to take care of lot frontage Ooh, this is a numeric feature but the most common one is 60 Let's have a look. Twelve hundred values, mean, standard, minimum. This is the median. This is the maximum. 
and have a look the mean and the median are pretty close to each other so and we don't have those many uh null values like this is a lot but not uh a disastrously large amount so we can have some amount of trust in the mean and median value and uh, in fact the mode is also not very far from that right so we can use any of those yeah so let's just do that now finally we have gotten rid of all the null values next is dealing with categorical and non numeric data so here's the so there are two main types of features okay one is a continuous feature of some sort and the other is categorical so in, in continuous features you will typically have some floating point value like 0 1.1 1 2.3 etc but in categorical it could be like red blue green it could be like uh, has cancer does not have cancer it could be something like uh, t-shirt size or yeah you get the idea right so various categories so the thing with categorical data is you cannot directly use it because uh, it's not numeric all our machine learning algorithms expect us to give numeric data so now what we need to do is we need to create a mapping a conversion from the non numeric form to a numeric form and there are two choices we have here so one choice is label encoding and the other is one hot encoding so in label encoding what happens is you take one you take all the unique values and you assign a whole number index a unique whole number index to each of them so for example if you have red blue green you could say red is mapped to 0 blue is mapped to 1 and green is mapped to 2 so yeah this is label encoding so let's just apply that here so have a look uh ms zoning is uh let's just see what is there in it dot link so it has these categories here right so one choice we have is we could label encode it so let's just do that label encoder just this is from scikit learn so if we go all the way back up we imported it from sklearn dot preprocessing okay so where were we yeah label encoding so let's just initialize the label encoder fit transform so uh, this is pretty much a standard feature of scikit learn's api so fit transform basically it looks at the data figures out what the transformation has to be and then applies that transformation to the data okay sorry uh yeah so yeah we have obtained the column in a label encoded form so uh something to note here label encoding maps uh increasing numeric value to each category what happens is it also creates a sense of ordering in those cases like for example if red is 0 blue is 1 uh green is 2 does that mean uh blue is greater than red numerically speaking or green is greater than blue numerically speaking no right but it's something that 
our uh, algorithms can pick up on and make a wrong inferences using that and it also has other issues like uh, what does a value 1.1 mean right it it doesn't make sense so there are issues with label encoding but we still use them in a few cases for example if we are using models which don't do any optimization in that sense where we are not fitting a cost function as such where we are not minimizing a cost function not doing gradient descent in that sense uh, we can probably get away with uh, using categorical uh, label encoded features so uh, examples of algorithms where this is probably fine are decision trees random forests gradient boosting so these types of algorithms don't really have a simple you know optimization step in the typical sense so there is no danger from label encoding so if we decide not to label encode what is our other choice one hot encoding so in one hot encoding is uh, wh what is there in one hot encoding is that uh, suppose you have r uh, red green and blue right those are the three options which you have so what you do is you create three columns one column for red one column for green one column for blue now if your original column had in a particular uh, particular row if it has red then you put a one in the red column and zeros in the other columns so let me show you this with an example so pd dot get dummies is the command and you would just pass the column names so have a look here see so this is how it is so for each feature we had an original feature heating right and uh, what basically happens is okay let me show you more so uh, lock, uh, all columns first 20 rows let's say uh, sorry first 20 rows uh, all columns right and yeah so you can see here wherever the original data frame had ir1 as the value in lot shape over there we now have a one okay so this is what one hot encoding looks like so what's nice about this is that it does not create an inherent ordering between the different classes within a column but it's very memory inefficient but there are ways around that like you can use sparse matrices and uh, scikit-learn supports sparse matrices by default so that's fine and this type of thing is something you'll see very frequently in uh, well not this exactly but a variation of this you'll see a lot in uh, classical nlp machine learning algorithms right so moving on now uh, another thing to just quickly take care of is duplicate rows duplicate rows are a uh, small thing but they uh, don't really like they don't add any information and they can skew the training a bit so it's better to get rid of them right so what you can do is 
main df dot drop uh, axis is equal to rows labels is equal to main df dot index of main df dot duplicated and do it in place so a lot of these commands you have to like practice yourself you know and get a sense of that so now we come to an important final step which is the train test split so one thing to note is that all these steps we have done so far we have done on the training and test data put together okay we do not apply these separately because uh, that can create its own bunch of issues you know like for example when you're doing one hot encoding or label encoding uh, you might just uh, you might there might be a category which is there in the test data but is not there in the training data so your label encoding or one hot encoding won't be able to deal with that properly or uh, there might be some missing values in the test as well which you have to take care of stuff like that basically it's better to just when you're doing pre-processing, just merge, pre-process, and then split again. Okay, so getting back to the point. Train test split, right? So basically the thing is, you cannot validate a machine learning model on just the training data itself, the data you pass to the uh, algorithm so here is where I make the distinction okay whatever you pass to the machine learning algorithm for training that is whatever the algorithm sees and makes its optimization on that is the training data and everything else uh, is a test split okay so the reason for this is we want our machine learning algorithm to generalize to data it has not seen before so it's like if you study in a exam, uh, if you study for an exam and uh, you are only able to answer the questions which were there in the textbook and not new questions, that doesn't mean you know the subject well, right? The same principle applies here. The machine learning algorithm should be able to give correct answers even for data which it has not seen before. That's the whole point of it. Therefore, we should test it on data it has not seen before which is where the training and test split happens. This is typically a method used to check for overfitting, for generalizability, and it is a very, very important step. Training error and training accuracy literally has no meaning in machine learning, okay? Everyone always looks at the test data and its results. So for train test split, let's just uh, this is the function this is from scikit-learn uh, again so train test split not defined let's import it from sklearn dot model selection import train test split right Let's see what happened here. Okay, let's, uh, something has gone wrong. Let's run it back from the beginning. right so yeah that's pretty much it you can set a train size
okay so now let's do an example problem or two from the beginning so we import all our stuff we have some metrics mean squared error mean absolute error train test split so let's just take some data so here we have a car name year selling price the current price uh, which is the you know MRP kilometers driven fuel type seller type transmission owner so uh, the main objective is to predict the selling price okay so this is a regression problem because uh, the variable we wish to predict the target is a continuous variable hence it's a regression okay so let's just quickly run through all the steps so just check for null values and this is another thing you can do if you suspect the null value has been replaced by something else you can just perform this uh, step here so no missing values pretty much so car name is clearly a categorical feature but there are uh, far too many values for us to do you know any kind of processing to that in the sense every car every unique car name is its own category so if we do label encoding that is not very good because we're using linear regression uh, label encoding doesn't play well with linear regression uh, but one hot encoding will create too many columns and we don't really have those many rows to deal with that right so let's just check the a number of columns we have uh, sorry the number of rows hardly 300 rows and we have 98 unique values for the car name so not really enough data to deal with every single car name there might be some car names which come only once in the entire data set so it, it's, it's better to just uh, let go of this data so we're going to drop that yeah car name is gone and now let's see what all we have to one not encode fuel type seller type and the transmission so let's do that and now you can see fuel type cng fuel type diesel fuel type petrol and then you have seller type dealer seller type individual you have transmission automatic transmission manual right and now just take care of any duplicate rows. And now let's uh, create the X and Y matrices. Okay. So that worked. And now let's split it. So in train test split, if you give it an X and a Y, it creates a split appropriately of both the X and the Y and another thing you can do is you can sometimes uh, decide to keep it in the same proportion okay so basically what I mean is uh, the target if it's a categorical feature or a, or more specifically if it's a binary feature you can have it split such that the proportion of each target value in each split is the same so what i mean is basically suppose your data is having a imbalance suppose the target which is y here is a binary feature and it has zero and one as the two categories suppose zero is 90 percent of the time there and one is 10 percent of the time there when you do the train test split you can choose an option such that uh, even in the training and testing splits, it will be 0, 90% and 1, 10%. So the option for that is train. Let me just look up the documentation and show you. So the option for that is stratify. Okay, so if you put 
stratify is equal to true, then it'll do that. Uh, well, not true, you have to give a column name. So stratify is equal to Y would work out for that. But let's not do that here because this is uh, in this is a regression problem. Okay, so no need to do that here. So now let's just get a model from scikit-learn. Most of the cases it's not as easy as this, but just fit and predict. And then you can compute the various, uh, you know, metrics. So mean squared error, we imported that from sklearn.metrics. Mean squared error, mean absolute error, right? So where were we? Yeah, mean squared error, mean absolute error. Now let's perform the same uh, operations on the test data. Just predict mean squared error, mean absolute error. Not bad, not bad. Now let's do the same thing for a classification example. So here we have accuracy and the F1 score and we, we'll use logistic regression and we'll use Gaussian and Bernoulli naive base. So the difference between Gaussian naive base and Bernoulli naive base is that uh, the Gaussian naive base fits uh, each category. You have a Gaussian fit to it, which makes sense if the uh, features are primarily uh, continuous. And Bernoulli naive base works better when the features are binary in nature. Okay. So let's just get our data, have a look at it. So this is another thing to watch out for. So let's just, so it's taken the first row and thought that those were the headers. Let's just correct that. So this is better, but we still have no clue what the data actually is. So in the documentation for the data, this was present. So I am just renaming the columns using this dictionary. And yes, even though I could have passed an array, uh, I mean a list, uh, pandas expect a dictionary, so pass a dictionary, okay? And again, in place is equal to true. So yeah, now it makes much more sense. So this is, uh, let me check where we, ah yes, this is a heart disease prediction problem. So, yeah, let's just quickly go over the steps. We have some missing values here. So just have a look, okay. So here the mode is zero in this particular column. So we can just replace the missing values with that. So that's taken care of. Now let's see this one. You can see that we have two missing values. So we can just replace uh, that with the mode as well. Now what we have to do is categorical to numeric. And uh, we will change the target to a binary form since we won't be predicting the severity of the heart disease. So let us just uh, make this, let's just run through this really. We'll one hot these, we've binarized this, one hotted.
and let's perform the split. So for logistic regression, it is pretty much this. So I would encourage you to look at the documentation for scikit-learn for each model that you use because uh, there are a lot of hyperparameters that are very useful and uh, very often for the same model you can get radically different results for different hyperparameters. So get into the habit of reading the documentation and actually try to understand what the model is doing because it is very very important. So let's just fit it and let's see how the predictions are. Not bad. Now I will leave it to you to figure out what the F1 score is, okay? Think of it as an exercise. Uh, you need to look at the various metrics which are available because not accuracy is not the be all end all. I'll give you a hint. Suppose cancer occurs in 1% of the population, okay? In 1% of your data, cancer is present. What if you have a model which always predicts that cancer is not present? So it will have 99% accuracy, right? But you and I both know that that would be a garbage model. So yeah, this is pretty much it. A couple of flavors of naive base. And naive base is just pretty much a very easy thing. So similar performance. Bernoulli naive base is not that great at this, but yeah, okay. And this is an advanced thing. You can just have a look at it. I'll be sharing this notebook with you later. Right? Okay. Now let's open another notebook. So now this is more about exploratory data analysis and some advanced pre-processing techniques. So EDA is basically looking at the data and trying to figure out some stuff before you train a model. It's, it's not just data science is not about just taking your data, doing a little bit of pre-processing and sending it to a model and having the model make the inferences for you. In many, many cases, it is in fact much be better for the data scientists to try to come up with some inferences on their own using qualitative approaches, just looking at the data, getting some inferences from some graphs and things like that. That's something which can be done, right? And yes, important disclaimer, this is more art, less science. So uh, the first thing is skew, okay? So this is an important pre-processing aspect. Let me just generate some data, okay? So as you can see, this, uh, so I've just plotted a histogram of the data, okay? So this data is, left skewed because the tail on the left is thicker than on the right. Now this is problematic because we have many many models which expect that the features are distributed in a Gaussian manner for each category or in general, right? So if you look up uh, maximum likelihood estimation for many models like Gaussian naive Bayes, logistic regression, linear regression, uh, we are assuming that the features are distributed as per a Gaussian. But this is very clearly not a Gaussian. So what we can do is we can uh, perform some basic skew removal techniques. So we can shift it a bit using either exponential or log. So here we can just apply the exponential and this is what happens pretty much. So this is what we started out with. This is what we get if we apply an exponential. Now the reason for this to happen is the points on the right they get shifted 
further to the right compared to the points on the left. That's the nature of the exponential. Okay. And uh, this is what we end up with. And now for right skewed data, you can apply the log. But just be careful. The log is not defined for negative values. So if I have some right skewed data like this, let me apply the log and we get normally distributed data. This is again a bit of an art in the sense sometimes you definitely don't want to do this. In some cases, the models don't care about skew or even if they care, sometimes the skew is less or there is bimodal data and stuff like that. So you have to use your judgment okay, and see what works, what gives you better results and try things out. Next is normalization and standardization. So uh, uh, the thing is normalization and standardization, they are used because different variables can have different scales. So if different features have different scales, suppose you have one feature which goes from zero to one million and you have another feature which just goes from zero to one then this can cause a problem with gradient descent because along one feature, the step size may be very large and along another feature, uh, it'll be smaller and uh, convergence is generally more difficult when the different features have different scales. Okay, so what is necessary is to bring them down to the same scale so that you can use a higher learning rate and so that your convergence is better. Right. So if you don't do this uh, normalization, you may notice that the you will need a very small learning rate and still you will need lots of iterations. And in some cases it may not even converge. This is particularly applicable if you perform polynomial regression or something like that where you generate polynomial features. It's very important to scale things appropriately in those cases as well. So uh, one approach is min-max normalization and then there is standardization using the mean and variance. So min-max normalization is very simple. Uh, let's just import. Right. Uh, so we have this data set. So this is a plot. So we have this data set on beers. So this is a plot of the ABV value. So there are various types of histograms. So now I'm introducing the Seaborn library. Okay. So this is, this gives a better visualization. So Seaborn is basically a, a package built on top of matplotlib and uh, it provides a lot of additional features. It makes things much simpler for more complicated plots. So uh, what it's doing is apart from giving the histogram, it's also kind of giving a representation of the probability density. Okay. And now what I've created here is this min max scalar. So what we do is we take the, we remove the minimum element from each element. We subtract that and then we divide by the size. So basically what happens is every element is rescaled to a value between zero and one. So let's just apply that. And now you can see that every value is between zero and one. Now this is nice, but there are some cases where this is not really useful. And uh, this sometimes can squash the data too much. If there are outliers, I'll just show you what outliers are in a minute. So in those cases, you will just standardize using the mean and the variance or rather the standard deviation. So here, what you do is you just remove the mean 
and divide by the standard deviation. Okay. So you can see that the it's a bit different from what you get when you just apply min max normalization. But it will be more resistant to outliers. In general though you can just use standard scalar from sklearn. Right? So this is the scaling which is done. And uh, yeah. Now let's look at outliers. Now outliers are basically points that lie outside the distribution of the data. In the sense, uh, these could be for a variety of reasons. It could be because of noise, it could be because of uh, measurement errors, some kind of sensor error or survey error, stuff like that. They are wrong in some sense of the word. And to detect outliers, you need it's a very qualitative process. So let's just. So this is a scatter plot of some data. You can clearly see that this point out here, far away from the rest of the data, is an outlier, right? So now let's do some out. Okay, I have to import that properly as well. So now we have some data here. We have avocados sold on particular dates with some average price, some volume, some features which are not really defined, right? So now let's just look at the average price in a box plot, okay? So a box plot is a way to represent the quartiles and outliers. So the central line in this box here is the median, okay? This represents the 70, 75th percentile and this represents the 25th percentile. And this is the, so basically this box width here is the interquartile range, okay? And the two whiskers extend from the respective, these two whiskers here, this right whisker and this left whisker. They extend from the respective quartile from here to 1.5 times the interquartile range. And every point other than that, every point which does not lie in this range is highlighted here. And these may be outliers, these may not be outliers. So you, you have to... Uh, apply uh, your common sense here. Okay, there are some cases where the data will be imbalanced. So, uh, for example, if 99% of the data is of one value and 1% 1 is of another value, that 1%, you might consider it to be an outlier, but it could be something which is intrinsic to the data, something which is important as a feature. So it's better to keep that sometimes. So you have to use your judgment here. So let's just create an outlier removal class. So basically what this is doing is it is scaling every value such that everything comes within the interquartile range, uh, the, within the whiskers, within 1.5 times the interquartile range. So whichever points are outside this whisker range, it's just shifting them such that they are at the whisker range. Okay. So let's just remove outliers in the average price. And now if you see the box plot, everything is in the appropriate uh, whisker range, but uh, that is whether to apply this or not depends on your data and you have to apply your judgment for this. So uh, there are some other interesting plots which can help you get a sense of how the data is distributed. 
so these are categorical plots like this for instance is a violin plot and uh, this for instance is a swarm plot uh, these this basically like you have two categories conventional and organic and you have the probability density for the average price depicted in this way so this is a good way of figuring out which category categorical features are actually important for making a decision so if these uh, densities were identical I would have probably assumed that this feature is not useful for predicting the average price but that is clearly not the case right So now coming to correlation, correlation is uh, basically uh, when two when two columns are correlated, you can kind of predict the value of the second column linearly using the first column so basically all the all the correlation means is that the columns are to some extent linearly dependent okay so one way which works to find out if columns are correlated strictly for continuous features is the pearson correlation matrix okay and the reason why correlated features are sometimes bad is because uh, uh, you know algorithms like linear regression they really particularly the closed form linear regression not the gradient descent one they really don't like correlated columns they don't like linearly dependent columns because the inverse of this x transpose x you know if you study linear regression using matrices in the closed form you'll find you have to invert x transpose x and that doesn't work out because of if there are linearly dependent columns that uh, matrix becomes singular so you can't invert it and in general correlated columns are not useful because it, it's basically the same data showing up again but typically with uh, more complicated models like neural networks we don't care so much about this still it's useful to see the correlation now if I do this I have no clue of what is actually going on in the data so what we can instead do is we can plot a heat map using again Seaborn let's plot a heat map here and now this makes much more sense for example we can see that total bags and small bags have some correlation and we can what else can we see total volume and total bags have some correlation and these mystery features here have some correlation and there is not much correlation between the average price and any of the other features i mean there's a small dependence on all of them but not that much of a situation where we have a single variable predicting it Mind you, you can only do this for a uh, for continuous features and continuous data. Using the Pearson correlation for categorical data makes absolutely no sense. Okay, do not do that. It's a typical rookie mistake. And these violin plots are again something you can just check out. And there are other ways of checking out correlation like the chi-square test and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, this is pretty much it on the EDA side. Uh, there are other things which you can check out. I would strongly encourage everybody to explore quite a bit, you know. For example, uh, you know what, let me just... show you something let me just add chrome to this screen share uh, right so now um, 
let me just um, logistic so just have a look here there are plenty of hyperparameters which you can mess around with and it's very important that you check all of them out okay and it's important to understand this because uh, for example, this one, if you have Im imbalanced data, this is your lifesaver, okay, class weight, if you have imbalanced data. So stuff like this, you should really, really check out. And uh, in general, if you're using a model like SVM, just have a look. Uh, whenever I use one of these models, I just take a look at the, you know, the, the, the documentation. And even for uh, Seaborn, there's some interesting stuff. For example, if I just go one second. If I just. Yeah. There is all kinds of stuff here, like these categorical scatter plots and swarm plots and uh, in a different axis box plots uh, violin plots bar plots all kinds of stuff and you can get a nice idea of things uh, through these so yeah, just explore a lot is all I would say. Right, that's all I have to say right now. Thanks for uh, watching this video. Bye.